Thank you for inviting me. I'm, uh, I, d I direct the Scripps Cal Coffee program, and, and I was told that not everyone here knows about Cal Coffee, so I, I, I intended this, um, this talk to basically give people an introduction to Cal Coffee and then present some results related to prey availability related to marine mammals. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll give a history of Cal Coffee, talk about the design of the, of the uh, sampling program. Um, Tell you, tell you a bit about the time series of prey availability, and then uh, provide some data on climate, looking at changes in midwater oxygen concentration, which seem to have had a major impact on mesopelagic fish abundance. Um, okay, Cal Coffee stands for the California Cooperative uh, Oceanic Fisheries Investigations. It's an ocean observation program, one of, probably one of the longest and certainly one of the most comprehensive in the world today. It dates back to 1949 from the collapse of the Pacific sardine fishery uh, when the sardine fishery was the largest fishery in the entire Western Hemisphere. It, for, it's been from the beginning a partnership of, of Scripps Institution of Oceanography with the fisheries agencies, the Federal Southwest Fisheries Science Center at NOAA and the Cal Fish and, Cal Fish and Game Department. Um, basically, the objective from the beginning what was uh, to assess the abundance, or from the beginning it was to assess the abundance of sardine, and today that's been ex expanded to other species in the context of their spawning dynamics, their physical and biological environment, including competitors, predators, and prey. And the, the value of the partnership has been that Scripps has tended to look at the climate variability and uh, the lower trophic levels, and the fisheries agencies have looked at, at, the, uh, at the fish time and the fish assessments and their availability. Now the, the sampling program has changed quite a bit since 1949. It started out with this very, very comprehensive program with each of those dots representing a sampling station. It initially required, it went from, covered all of California down to the tip of Baja. Uh, it required three ships and it was carried out monthly. So this is for the first uh, about decade. As you can see, there were monthly cruises covering much of this, this area. Uh, this wasn't really sustainable. Uh, since 1984, the program has, has basically focused primarily on these six core transects in the, from the Southern California Bight to north of Point Conception. Um, there's also been several um, recent additions. For example, this uh, increased sampling near shore. These, these stations are, are funded by SCUS. Um, and there's also been changes uh, in recent years, as, as the spawning of the sardine has expanded northward, the spring cruises extend up to Monterey or, or San Francisco. Now, these are the, the sampling at each station goes down, is based on a CTD to 500 meters. Quite a number of, of parameters are, are measured. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically it's the t temperature, salinity, the uh, nutrients, chlorophyll, primary production at select stations. Most important, there's a, uh, a series of, of plankton toes, um, the bongo toes going up weekly to 200 meters, and out of that has come the zooplankton data that, that Mark Owen was just was talking about, and also the fish eggs and all fish eggs and fish larvae are removed, and today there's about 500 taxa that are identified from these samples, providing a time series going back to 1950. Um, more recently, this, in partnership with, this, with the California Current Ecosystem the LTER program that Morris talked about, there's a, quite a number of, of, of uh, further properties that are being examined, particularly related to the phytoplankton, micro and macro zooplankton. Um, some, some of the, uh, the other ancillary, there's other ancillary programs that are, that are ongoing. One of them that I'll particularly point out is, well, the sea, there are seabird observers on the cruises providing a seabird time series. <coughs> And uh, John Hildebrand's lab has been carrying out uh, marine mammal observations on the cruises, both uh, uh, based on observers, visual observations, and the passive acoustics. And then uh, most recently, um, in the last few years, I've introduced um, uh, acoustics and uh, mid-water trawl sampling, which is focused primarily on, on the uh, krill and the, uh, and the micronecton, as well as small pelagics. Um, and that's what some of what I'll show today. So for, in terms of forage time series, we have krill time series from the zooplankton bongo toes, which, which Margaret just talked about. 
There's also egg production time series which combine egg and larval abundance, fecundity, and spawning dynamics for the key commercial species such as North Air anchovy, Pacific sardine, Pacific cake. Uh, these can be carried out at various point times. And then the larval indices, which I mentioned from taking out the fish eggs and fish larvae, provide indices of spawning stock biomass for about 500 ichthyoplankton, and also more recently for market squid and spiding lobster. Um, recently, I carried out a principal component analysis of those ichthyoplankton time series. Um, I'm just going to talk about the first component, which is the dominant pattern that came out, which was surprisingly didn't relate to the anchovy and sardine, but instead it, it pulled out uh, two dozen, 24, um, well, there were 27 taxa with loadings of greater than 0.5 on the first component, meaning that their time series was correlated with the first component at a level of 0.5 or greater. And 24 out of those 27 taxa were midwater fishes from about eight families, um, the major, major midwater families. Those include um, vertical migrators and non-migrators. They include plankton feeders and also some of the midwater predators, such as uh, stomiids, which are dragon fishes and so on. Um, Now these, the, the, in blue, this doesn't seem to be working very well, the blue line here shows the, um, uh, the time series for the first principal component, for, and what you can see is a clear uh, multi-decadal pattern. Uh, in green, we see the, the uh, changes in mean oxygen at 200 to 400 meters. Now this, the, the, the principal, first principal component is uh, significantly correlated with not only the oxygen, it's, it's correlated with the oxygen at level 0.75, it's also correlated significantly with the PDO and with the multivariate ENSO index. Um, <clears throat> now, if we look at the abundance of, of those midwater taxa between the, in the periods when they were most abundant, for example, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and compared to, say, to the first decade of the, of the 50s, this is just not working, 50s or the last decade of the two, from 2000 to 2010, um, there's basically a factor of 2.7 difference in the abundance of, of, of the mesopelagic meso, uh, fishes. Um, so it's a huge, a huge change in, in this period. There's, and this corresponds to a change of about 15 to 20 percent in, in oxygen content. So oxygen in the last 20 years has declined about about 20 percent in the uh, in this uh, Southern California current. And it's, uh, what's important here is that deep water oxygen is predicted to change due to global climate warming. Over the next century, it's predicted to decline on the order of 20 to 40 percent. So this is potentially, this is the first real report showing the potential impact of these declines of oxygen on the midwater uh, fauna and it potentially could have considerable implications in, the, in over the coming century. Now, we've, we also incorporated acoustic observations on these cruises. What I'm showing here is a, um, is a composite for those six core um, uh, cow coffee transects for the January 2010 survey. And what we have is the, the uh, backscattering normalized uh, ping by ping. What you can see is that over in the far left, where near, sh where we're near shore, there is evidence of some uh, uh, epipelagic school of fish. But as we move across the California current, we're going across for about 600 kilometers, we see that basically, okay, this is only the daytime backscattering. We see that basically virtually all the backscattering is, is found in the deep scattering layer from these, from these mesopelagic fishes and squids and, and so on. What I've also imposed here is, is the isoplets of oxygen concentration. And what the, the oxygen minimum zone is, the core of it is at about 550 to 700 meters depth. And what you can see is that the the deep scattering layer is, 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 is basically hard down in right above the core of the oxygen minimum zone. It's basically at levels of 0.5 to 1.5 mils of oxygen per meter. So it's very, it seems to be very, very closely linked to the, uh, to the uh, depth and the availability of oxygen. Um, we, with the acoustics, we've been able to come up with preliminary biomass estimates for the mesopelagic fishes. And what I've done here is compare the, the estimated biomass from the stock assessments for sardine plus anchovy, which over the past 10, 20 years has basically fluctuated around 1.7 billion tons. Now, if we compare, this is actually the first, these are the first estimates for biomass for mesopelagic fishes since the, since the 60s when Piercy, Bill Piercy up in Oregon did some work off, off Oregon using small nets. So this is the first acoustic estimates. And what we see is that in, in, in the, 
2010, our estimated biomass of, of migrators is probably about close to twice that of the anchovy and uh, sardine in the California current. And for total mesopelagic fishes, it's several times larger. Now, if we recall that the mesopelagic biomass was, was a factor of 2.7 higher uh, in, the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we see that um, in that period, we estimate that the uh, biomass of the total mesopelagic biomass was, was probably on the order of an order of magnitude higher than the biomass of anchovy and sardines. So that these are key, key, um, these are a, a key predators on the, on the, um, on the plankton production. Um, they're obviously a key conduit between the, um, the lower trophic levels and higher predators. The mesopelagics, as far as we know, they aren't, haven't been studied very, very to any great extent, but they do seem to be a key prey of, of several of the dolphin species, beaked whales, and fur seals. Um, now, there's <clears throat> how is this? The question is really is how, is, how has this affected marine mammals? Uh, there's been quite significantly reduced biomass in the 50s and since 2000, but on compensating that, the oxygen minimum zone has shoaled by about 40 meters in this period. And that potentially makes those mesopelagic prey more available to those visual predators and perhaps to, to uh, diving mammals. Um, but this is basically something that still needs to be examined. So in summary, Cal Coffee, I, I did want to present Cal Coffee to you, show that it does provide time series that are available to, to researchers uh, for climate, chesoplankton for fish, and for in, invertebrate taxa. Um, and that also of the micronecton. The, the mesopelagic fishes represent a key, quite understudied group in the California current and elsewhere, and it's of key importance to several of, of the marine mammal species of prey. Now, some of the key questions that, that arise is um, what have been the impacts of these changes in mesopelagic prey biomass to marine mammals and other top predators, and also what are the implications of future climate change and declining midwater oxygen, mid oxygen for the met these mesopelagic fishes um, and uh, by implication for marine mammals. Thank you.